When you look at it from the micro side, you have flows of goods going back and forth. But when you look at it from the macro side, the current account deficit of a country is the difference between total investment in that country and total savings. Okay? And that will remain true no matter how you measure the flow of the goods or of the value added. And this is a, you know, a challenging kind of conundrum in a way. I must say quite, I mean, I've thought about it, but I haven't come to the, fully to the grips with it. You said, for example, I think you said the China-US deficit would be only half of what it is if it was measured in value added. Mm -hmm. OK. But the current accounts of China and the US will remain the same. So how, how, how do you explain that? How, how can you help us think this through? I mean, you're absolutely correct. Uh, measuring trade in added value will not change the fact that the US has an overall trade deficit and that China has an overall trade surplus. Uh, it will simply give a totally different picture of where is this made of. Right. Huh? Well, years ago, the uh, US had a big trade deficit with Japan. Uh, now, uh, China has a big trade deficit with Japan. And the US has a big trade deficit with China, huh? because a large part of what China ships to the US uh, comes from Japan. And this is a confirmation of what we all know, huh? which is that current account imbalances are not trade related. They have to do with macroeconomic realities, which basically is uh, the uh, relative proportion of uh, investment, uh, consumption, uh, savings. So, all economists know that the trade balance is the other side of a macroeconomic balance. But what measuring trade in added value helps doing is realizing that this is not a trade problem. And by the way, probably even more importantly, that these imbalances cannot be corrected through trade measures. And that's something, again, which we, we've known for a long time. Simply the way we measure trade until now couldn't help us realizing this. Now, the first uh, numbers uh, for, I think, uh, uh, 60 countries or so uh, will appear uh, at the end of this year. Uh, we've been working, as you said, very hard for the last uh, three or four years with a whole network of uh, academics, uh, uh, statistician, uh, OECD, which been, uh, has been doing the heavy uh, workload. Uh, it's, by the way, a very interesting way of, of sort of a network of various bits and pieces, places, uh, the ability of which to uh, collect these, these numbers and put them together is incredibly helped by, you know, internet, uh, uh, and, and other systems. And I think the moment we start looking at these new numbers will change the way we look at that. And of course, with, I hope, positive consequences on the trade debate. Uh, everybody knows that in the US, for instance, and not only during electoral campaigns, uh, there's a huge sort of you know, China focus and the bilateral trade deficit between US and China, the way we measure it today, just you know, hypes this right. as a formidable issue. Whereas if you look at it properly, what really matters in trade policies at the end of the day for the people is whether it's job creating, job disrupting. We know it is both creating and job, job disrupting. We know that overall for a country like this one, trade, participation enhances the quality of jobs, not always the numbers, but the quality.